<laughs> I, I laugh so hard every time I watch that because that there's a lot of people that still picture Jesus that way. <laughs> And uh, today's message is called, it, it's all, it All Starts Here, and we're going to talk about uh, Christmas. We are in the Christmas season. This is December. Can you believe that? And um, so for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about Christmas. And, um, you know, Christmas is always looked at as this warm, fuzzy, loving holiday, and it's got, you know, some spiritual implication uh, and, and some spiritual happenings, but a lot of people almost look at it as as just the time of giving and loving on people and and that Jesus is like the the baby Jesus I mean that's what we have this image of you know what Ricky Bobby was talking about there um and and we have that image we have the image of the cattle we have the image of the you know the manger and we we have the image of the shepherds and the wise men and we know about the angels and the heavenly host uh, but most people don't think of Christmas as a spiritual happening. But it really is a very spiritual happening. Christmas is the beginning of all things spiritual that we as followers of Jesus enjoy on a, on a daily basis. Christmas is where it all starts. This is where it all starts for you if you're a believer. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6, it says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now I want you to notice a couple of things in this, is that it says unto us. A child is born. Now, during this time, we do acknowledge the eight pound, five ounce baby Jesus with his little fat fist balled up next to his face. Okay, yes, that's that's truth. This is when he came with his little golden fleece diapers and everything else that we just heard. Okay? But now here's the thing. He was born... Of course, to Mary and Joseph, but here's what I want you to catch out of this verse. He was born unto us. Unto us. This marked the starting point, the beginning for us. And I want to talk to you about three things today that started at Christmas. All right? Three things. The first one is this. Christmas started your redemption. This is where it all starts, right here. This is not just, you know, cuddly Jesus born in a, in a manger. This is not, you know, and listen, I don't have no problem with Santa Claus. Anybody wants to call him Satan Claus or whatever, come on, <laughs> give me a break. I don't have no problem with Santa Claus. I don't have a problem with Christmas trees. I don't have no problem with giving presents. But I'm going to tell you something. That manger is what the reason all this started. This, this manger was the beginning of us being redeemed. Now let's look at the word redeemed or redemption for a second. It actually means just the action of gaining or regaining possession of something in exchange for a payment. It also means a clearing of debt. Now, now when I say this is the beginning of your redemption, what does that mean? It means this is the beginning process of God gaining you back, not as a possession. This is where people miss it. We don't belong to God as a possession. We belong to God, come on, as family. We belong to God as children. What was going on here is he was restoring a relationship with his kids. Come on, somebody. Has anybody ever had family that's been estranged and then reconciled? And it's such a sweet moment because you never wanted to be estranged from them to begin with. No matter what they did, 
You wish, and, and even if, some of you may be sitting in here right now that have a, a strange relationship with somebody in your family, and you wish you could snap your fingers and fix that right now. That it would just all be erased, because nobody likes to be estranged. Well, this is, what, this is what I'm talking about. When I say this Christmas marks the beginning of your redemption, there was a separation, an estrangement, if you will, between God and all of us. Come on, you couldn't have access to him. Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14 says, All right, then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now, what does the word Emmanuel mean? It sounds real nice. We sing it in songs. It means God is with us. Well, how can he be with us if he's estranged from us? Up until that point, God was not accessible to anybody except three people. He was only accessible by the prophet. He was only accessible by the priest. And he was only accessible by the king. Those were the only three people that could enjoy the presence of God. <laughs> now you think about that. You come to church on Sunday, but you're not allowed to talk to God. You could come to temple, you could present your sacrifice, but you can't say anything. You have to ask me or one of the associate pastors to pray for your behalf. Because we're allowed to talk to God and you aren't. Maybe some of you have been raised in a church where you still think that. I'm not allowed to talk to God. I, I've been so floored when I talk to some people that grow up in certain uh, churches and certain denominations that they can't, they feel like they have to go talk to somebody else to talk to God for them. But that's not what redemption was all about. Redemption was not so that you could go talk to somebody else. Redemption was so that you could go and talk to God yourself. You can have a personal, come on somebody, relationship with God. God had a pure relationship with man, and then man messed it up. <laughs> and that sounds just about like us, doesn't it? I mean, you know, I, I think about some of the things that I've gotten in my life, and, and I'm curious, and I start tinkering with it. Anybody else? And, and you think, you know, oh, I wonder what this does. And next thing you know, it's, it's in pieces. And you go, I can put that back together. And it's just never the same. <laughs> God had not had a pure relationship with man since the Garden of Eden. Now, what kind of relationship did God have with man? Well, he would come down in the cool of the day and spend time with Adam and Eve. Now, let's talk about that for just a second. What kind of time are we talking about? Because a lot of us spend time with God now, but we didn't spend time with God like Adam and Eve did. I mean, they spent time with him in the flesh. So much so that the Bible says they recognize the sound of him walking. Now, I've talked about this in this church before. You've got to spend a lot of time with somebody if you recognize what the, their feet hitting the ground sound like. You married people know what I'm talking about. You can hear somebody's footsteps in the house and know who it is. You can tell if it's one of your kids or if it's one of your spouse. Or not one of your spouse, <laughs> your spouse. <laughs> we got a whole nother conversation if you got more than one. <laughs> you can tell. I can tell Jody's, I can tell Jody's uh, gait, is that the right word? When she walks through the house compared to one of my kids. I mean, Peyton, well, no, <laughs> Preston's getting close. He's almost the same size as Jody. So, I mean, <laughs> they're, I mean they're, they're, he's almost as tall and, you know, but, but you can tell a distinct sound difference to me. I know. I can tell when Peyton comes through, it's very fast, and he's, the bottom of his feet are callous, so it sounds like sandpaper running across the... <laughs> I know. I can tell who it is. This is what... Adam and Eve had with God. Come on. They hung out with God so much in the flesh that they could recognize the way the, 
the, the grass smushed under his feet. They recognized that sound. And this is what God wanted with us again. He wanted to have that kind of relationship with man again, that he could come and spend the cool of the day with us. But the only way that was going to happen is if there was a price that was paid. Okay? There was a price that paid, that had to be paid for a debt that had been racked up. The debt had been racked up by us. Christmas was the day that the currency for the full amount that was owed on the debt was delivered, come on somebody, to the earth. Now that, that, that might be a little bit, well, that, that's nice. Let me, let me break this down for you. How many of you get a paycheck? Really? That's all? <laughs> Nobody's excited about it? Come on now, when, when payday comes, it puts a little bit of spring in your step. Come on. Yeah, it's payday. Come on, somebody. And you go to the, you know, you, you go pick that check up, or you go, and if you get the automatic deposits, you get, you, you open up your bank app, and you go, woohoo! Now, I'm not talking about when you're all, you're paid your bills and your rent and everything. I'm talking about right when it drops in there, and the big smile pops up on your face. That's what I'm talking about. That was what was delivered. The day Jesus was born in the manger, your redemption started. The clearing of your debt started. The regaining back for you to God started at Christmas. My uncle Paul owns a construction company just outside of Washington, D.C. It's, it's called Facina Construction Company. And they are the firm that rebuilt the Pentagon right after 9-11. They had just finished working on it. I mean, he's, he's like the guy in Washington, D.C. I mean, I sometimes have, have, have you know, I'm, I ask my aunt, who's my mom's baby sister, I'm like, what kind of connections do you have to have to be the guy to build, you know, bomb-proof buildings and get all the government contracts? I mean, are we talking like Fat Tony-type connections? Because his last name is Facina, and, you know, and we laugh about it and joke around. Paul owns the construction company that rebuilt the Pentagon and then bomb-proofed all the government buildings. And so, let's just say it this way. He's successful, to say the least. And so, the, the house that they live in is, is right on the Potomac River, and it sits on 600 acres. The house, the original house, the, the basement was poured during the Revolutionary War. And the original house was torn down during the Civil War, and they built this Gone with the Wind, big mansion, southern plantation type house. You know what I'm talking about, the big ones? And so, and, and so when you go in there, I mean, now this house is a historical landmark in Maryland. They, they, he wasn't allowed to do very much to it. Um, you know, like underneath the house is still... The shackles are still in the walls from when they had the slaves, and, and the floor joists are, are hand-cut. So, I mean, he wasn't allowed to touch very much of that at all because it's historical, and, the, you know, and there's graves all over <laughs> out there that are, some of them predate the Revolutionary War. Uh, I mean, this is a very historical place. And so he bought this place, uh, and the way he bought it, it, it ties back into our message here. He went and was trying to find out who owned it. And there was a holding company that owned it. So uh, the holding company was in Europe somewhere. And so he called them and said, hey, how much do you want? And it's called the Mount Air Estate. How much do you want for that? And they're like, well, we're actually not selling any of our properties right now because we're actually liquidating the entire company and, and Paul, being a successful um, businessman, says, uh, says, okay, how much do you want for the company? That's pretty big, isn't it? That's big thinking. And so they told him, and he said, well, we negotiate out of price, and I just bought the company. <laughs> okay. Well, I said, well, uh, why'd you do that? And he goes, 
because they had something, watch this, that I wanted. So then he had to fly to Geneva, Switzerland, with his vice president. Some of us think, wow, that's so awesome. I would never get, you're, you're, you're going to miss the point if you, if you hang up on these details. But he goes to Switzerland, and he goes into a bank and meets with the president of the company, and they're signing over paperwork and stuff. And um, as they make the signature, his vice president is sitting there with him, and he says, uh, they, they, the, the head banker says to him, he goes, what do you, um, how do you want this? He goes, what do you mean? He goes, how do you want the money? And he goes, uh, I mean, aren't, isn't that what we're here to do? We're just doing a transfer of funds? He goes, we don't do transfer of funds here. You actually have to have the funds with you. And he's like, he goes, now, I'm not going to tell you how much it was, but for the sake of the story, let's just say $10 million. Might have been more than that. He said, but for $10 million, he goes, well, I didn't bring $10 million. They said, well, uh, you need to call your bank and have your bank do the tra transfer of the funds here, and then we'll give you the funds, and you can give them to him. So he goes, I had to go back across. There was a meeting room in the back. They, they had an alley, and then here's the main bank. So they go through this alleyway into and so he walks over, and he's thinking, okay, now we're going to transfer the funds. So he signs this paper and slides it over there. And they look at him, and they go, how do you want that? And he goes, what do you mean? He goes, do you want it in euros or pounds or yen? What do you want? You know? And he goes, American? The guy goes, okay. And he starts sitting up on the counter these big, huge, hermetically sealed bags of cash fresh from the U.S. Mint. <laughs> the, his vice president was telling me the story. He said, I could feel the sweat starting to trickle down my forehead because, first of all, I've never seen that much money in cash, $10 million at least, in cash as it's trickling down my forehead. And He goes, then I'm thinking, I have to walk back through this bank and outside through this alley into the other building with $10 million in cash. And so they put it in, they just put it in like shopping bags. This is like out of a movie, not a briefcase with a, you know, <laughs> with a handcuff and a lock. We're talking bags of cash that are hermetically sealed. And so he, he says, can I have some help with this? And they're like, would you like a, you know, security? And he goes, yes, please. So he gets two armed security guards and they carry however much it really was, but again, $10 million, through the bank, out into the lobby, and he goes the whole time, or not the lobby, the alley, he goes, I'm looking, like, like is, there, <laughs> is there somebody around, you know, as we're walking to the other building. And he walks in and sits $10 million in cash down on the table and slides it across to the president of the holding company. And the guy looks at him, signs the piece of paper, and says, thank you, we have a deal. Now, what are you talking about? What does that have to do? Listen to me. Something far more valuable than $10 million was delivered to the earth, but it was the price yeah. exactly that had to be paid for you, come on somebody, to get back into a relationship with God. It was delivered to the earth with armed security guards called the heavenly host that stood up and said, glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, good will toward men. This is where it started for you. Yeah. Amen. Your redemption started on Christmas. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Christmas was on. Uh, let me say this before we, before we move on. All right. We all want to talk about Calvary and the empty tomb, and it is important. It is. Because with no empty tomb, there is no salvation. But without a full manger, come on, there is no empty tomb. Come on, somebody. Come on. Without a full manger, there's no empty tomb. All right? The second thing is this. Christmas was the beginning of every need you have being met. John chapter 10, verse 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But then he said this. These next words are huge. I have come. When did he come? Did he just come one day and just? No, he came on Christmas. I have come 
that they, who's they? Come on, somebody. Who's they? That's us. That they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Not just barely get along, not just hardly, come on somebody, not just a little bit. Jesus didn't die, didn't didn't come, didn't die, and didn't raise himself back up just so that you could barely get along. That doesn't mean we don't have to do anything. That means (laughs) he blesses everything we do do. That didn't sound right. He blesses everything that you do. (laughs) He didn't come just to barely get by and struggle and be depressed and upset and hurting all the time. Jesus said he came that we could have life more abundantly. The word abundant means in large quantities. Come on, somebody. Somebody ought to be more excited than that. Abundantly means to live life in large quantities. The next word means plentiful. Come on, abundantly means plentiful. Jesus says it's more than plentiful. He came to be more than plentiful in your life. More than plentiful. Every need, not a few, not some, but every need you have. Come on, needs in your body, needs in your finances, needs in your emotional well-being. Come on, needs of feeling completed. Come on. He came to fulfill them all. More abundantly. Those of you who are looking for good jobs, Jesus take, Jesus came, come on, so you can get a good job. Come on. Not just a barely get by job, a good job. The list goes on and on. This started at Christmas. It, our needs began being met when Jesus was brought forth in the tiny little manger, in a tiny little stable that was actually just left over. It's all the guy had. It was in this humble little city. I mean, I've heard other people that have been there say, you know, if it was here in the United States, we would call it the armpit of whatever state you live in. I mean, Bethlehem was not a nice place, all right? It had declined so much so it was nothing more than a humble, dirty village. But in this humble, dirty village, with very little means to it, the barn that Jesus was born in was, actually became the birthing suite. Come on now. <laughs> you ever go see somebody that's having a baby now, and they have these birthing suites? It's not just a cold hospital room anymore. They're nice. And they got, you know, these big comfortable beds. Come on. And they got these big, nice rocking chairs. And it's a suite. And you got room for people to sit in there with you. And and everybody can kind of enjoy the entire process (laughs) while the mom sits there and screams. (laughs) (laughs) This barn became a birthing suite for every need of every human being to be met. Come on. on, It didn't happen in in a palatial five-star Marriott. Come on, it happened in a barn. But it's all it takes is a place for God to manifest in our lives. As long as we'll give him room, our needs can be met. And Christmas marks the beginning of that. All right? The third thing and the final thing is this. Christmas was the beginning of the enemy not being able to do whatever he wants to do in your life. First John chapter 3, verse number 8. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. This was the beginning of the end for him. 
Some of you go, well, I don't know about that. I mean, he's doing some pretty good damage in my life right now. Well, stop letting him. Amen. He's defeated. And this was the beginning of the end for him. From the time of the Garden of Eden, Adam had been put in charge of everything that was made on God's hands. I mean, the Bible says that he put him in the garden and he says, now, go forth, multiply, okay, replenish the earth. And then he said, and subdue it and have dominion over it. What does that mean? <laughs> Adam was, <laughs> he was the man. <laughs> and he was in charge. I've heard a theologian say that if there was a, a part of the, of the garden that needed to be watered, Adam could literally speak to the ground and say, secrete some water on that over there. And the, wa the ground would just open and l allow it to seep up out of it because it didn't rain. How did it get water? It just came right up out of the ground. <laughs> I heard another guy say, Adam activated the sprinklers just by telling them to come on. <laughs> <laughs> we saw a movie the other day, and uh, the guy's standing there, and he's like in a shower, and he's like, where's the knobs? To turn? How do you turn the shower on? And then you hear this little voice come on and go, bing, shower on, and he's fully clothed, and he just gets drenched. <laughs> and he goes, oh, how do you turn it off? And it turns itself off. And he goes, how do you turn it cold? And it was like cold water, and it comes out to the side. This is what we're talking about with Adam. Adam would actually speak to the ground, and it would, it would just water itself. When he sinned, he handed all the control of that over to Satan, and Satan was unchecked for the longest time, could do whatever he wanted to, whenever he wanted to. In, in fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 still calls him the God of this world. And some people actually miss it a little bit when they talk about Job. Because they think that, and if we had time, we'd go over there, but I'll, I'll just tell you the story real quick. The Bible t tells us the story of Job, that all the sons of heaven and, uh, were, were all meeting, and uh, it was basically all the angels and God, and, and Satan showed up, you know, because he used to be one of them. And he came in, and, and God says to him, he goes, what have you been doing? He goes, I've been looking all over the place for somebody to try. And he goes, have you considered my servant Job? Now, some people have read that and go, why would God throw Job under the bus like that? <laughs> but actually what he was saying to him, if you go and, and you research that out in Hebrew, he was actually saying to him, is it true that you are thinking about going after Job? God's calling him out on it, actually, because he knew what's getting ready to come down the line. And then he says, all that he has is yours. That, again, looks like God's just going, here, everything Job has, you can have access to it. You just can't kill him. But actually, what he was saying to Satan was what was already true. You, you already have access to everything he has. Why? Because Satan was the god of this world. He still is the god of this world. And God drew the line where he could. He said, but you can't kill him. And see, where God operates for us is where he has allowed himself to do things and still do it legally. And that, and that is to protect you and to keep you safe. But Satan was unchecked for the longest time, could do whatever he want to whoever he want, however he wanted. And the only help they had was to go to a prophet or a priest and ask, will you, you know, sacrifice for me or will you pray for me and will you give me a word? Or That's the only hope they had. Before Jesus came to the earth, the enemy could attack, and there was not much anybody could do about it. Okay? But now, at this point in the story, this began to change everything. When those angels lit up the sky, Satan knew his days were numbered. He did everything he could do to fight against it. But Jesus came... To end the reign and the freedom that Satan had. Because of him coming at Christmas, we can now stand up when an attack comes and say stop. Amen. Amen. Some of you go, well, really? Because it doesn't feel like that. This is why we don't go based on our feelings. We go by what the Bible says. When Satan's attacks come, we can stand up and say, wait a minute, you've already been defeated. 
you're not allowed to do that to me. Because of Jesus coming at Christmas, we can stop the enemy in his tracks and walk in victory against the tricks that he brings against us. I was here praying one, night, one Sunday night, and the Lord just spoke this to me while I was praying. Uh, and I spoke it out, and some of you that were here that night heard me say it. I just started talking to the devil, and I said, you're not allowed to do whatever you want to do. You're not allowed to deceive the people that go to this church. They're, they're members of our family, so you're not allowed to. Come on, you're not allowed to just do whatever you want in my finances, or in my body, or in my church, or in my, you're not allowed. And then I said this, and it just, this is by the Spirit of God. I just said, it's not your time yet. It's my time. It's our time. How can you be so bold about that? There's a time coming when Satan is going to be able to be free to do whatever he wants to do. But Jesus told us when he left, he said, occupy or maintain until I come. Now, once he gets us and pulls us out of here, it's a whole, it's a whole nother. That's why it's important to have a relationship with Jesus. Because as long as you have a relationship with Jesus, it's your time. Come on, it's your time. It's your time to enjoy the blessings of God. It's your time to enjoy freedom. It's your time to enjoy healing. Come on, somebody. It's your time to enjoy prosperity. It's your time for God to show up just like he showed up in the manger in your life and do something. There was once a man named George Thomas. He was a pastor in a small New England town. One Easter Sunday morning, he came to the church carrying a rusty, bent, old some fun with them i'm gonna tease them pull out all their feathers make them fight each other i'm gonna have a real good time the pastor answered but you'll get tired of those birds sooner or later what are you gonna do then the little boy responded oh i got some cats they like birds i'll take them over to them the pastor was silent for a moment how much do you want for those birds son huh why would you want these birds, mister? They're just plain old field birds. They don't sing. They ain't even pretty. How much do you want, the pastor asked again. The boy sized up the pastor as if he were crazy, and he said, $10. The pastor reached in his pocket, took out a $10 bill, placed it in the boy's hand, and in a flash, the boy was gone. The pastor picked up the cage, gently carried it to the end of the alley where there was a tree and a grassy spot. He set the cage down, opened the door, and by softly tapping the bars, persuaded the birds to get out, setting them free. Well, that explained the empty bird cage on the pulpit, and then the pastor began to tell this story. One day, Satan and Jesus were having a conversation. Satan had just come from the Garden of Eden, and he was gloating and boasting. Yes, sir, I just caught the, world, uh, got, caught the world full of people down there. I set me a trap, used some bait. I knew they couldn't resist, and I got every one of them. What are you going to do with them, Jesus asked. Satan replied, oh, I'm going to have some fun. I'm going to teach them how, many, uh, how, how to marry and divorce each other. I'm going to teach them how to hate and abuse each other. I'm going to teach them how to drink and smoke and curse I'm going to teach them how to invent guns and bombs and kill each other. I'm going to have real fun. And what will you do with them when you're done with them, Jesus asked. Oh, I'll kill them, said Satan proud, proudly. How much do you want for them, Jesus asked. Oh, you don't want these people. They're no good. Why, 
You'll take them, and they'll just hate you for it. They'll spit on you. They'll curse you. They'll eventually kill you. You don't want anything to do with these people. How much? Jesus asked again. Satan looked at Jesus and sneered. All right, all of your tears and all of your blood. Jesus answered, done. Then he paid the price. The pastor then picked up the cage, opened the door, and walked away from the pulpit. Christmas is the beginning of your redemption. Christmas is the beginning of your needs being met. And Christmas is the beginning of the end of Satan's rule in this world. When you feel all warm and fuzzy and you feel all cuddly here at Christmas, make a point to expect to feel spiritual. The spiritual life that we know, the church that we worship at, the blessings that fill our lives, the victory over every challenge that we face, and the way of life that comes from knowing Jesus started at Christmas. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for sending him to redeem us, cause our needs to be met, and for ending Satan's rule in our lives. Lord Jesus, we ask today that you'll help us to see what this season is all about, what this time of year that we celebrate at. Lord, we know you probably could have come at a different time of year, and some people think you did. But Lord, this is the time we mark to celebrate the fact that you came. You came for us. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, just thank him right now. Come on. You're able to live because of Jesus. And when you're opening your presence this year, you need to tell him thank you for coming, Lord. Thank you for coming. Come on, when you're eating your turkey dinner with your family, you need to say, thank you, Lord, for coming. Enjoy that spiritual blessing in your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now listen, if you're here today with heads bowed and eyes closed and you don't know the Lord Jesus, you don't have a relationship with him, Listen, today can be the beginning for you. What better Christmas present could you ask for than eternal life? What better Christmas present could you ask for than having your needs met and freedom because of that relationship with Jesus? You couldn't ask for a better present. You'd never get one better than that. And so today I want to invite you, if you don't know Jesus, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, today's your day and right now is the time to do it. So I'm going to say a prayer up here and I want you to say it right there at your seat. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to make a big scene out of it. We're going to give you an opportunity to meet Jesus today. And so if you want to know him, you want to have that relationship, you want today to be your beginning of these things happening in your life. Would you say this prayer with me? Say this prayer with me right now. Father God, I come to you today a sinner. But I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that you raised him from the dead. And I believe that Jesus is Lord of all. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new person. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer with me this morning, the Bible tells us that you are not the same person that came in those doors today. You're not the same person that got up out of bed today. You're a brand new person. And just like the angels filled the sky in celebration of the birth of Jesus, the Bible tells us those same angels are now celebrating on the streets of heaven today because you made Jesus Lord of your life. 
Hallelujah. Come on, today's the beginning of your redemption. Today's the beginning of your needs being met. Today is the beginning of Satan not being able to reign and rule in your life anymore. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. The chains be broken. Every chains place. Lives be healed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Eyes be open. The Christ is revealed. Thank you, Jesus. One more time. Thank you, Lord. The chains be broken. On every chain in this place. The eyes be lives be healed. Let's sing it. Eyes be open. Eyes be open. The Christ is revealed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now listen, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus throughout this month, don't just picture him as that baby anymore. That's how he came, and that's how it started, but that's not how it finished. Hallelujah. He is Lord of all. Come on, and if you've got a relationship with him, that means he's Lord over everything in your life. And when things come, that's why you can go to him and say, Jesus... You got mail. There's something going on that I need to talk to you about. And he'll, he'll, listen, the Bible says he'll overlook millions of other people who do not believe like that and come and talk to you. His, all, his eyes are going to and fro looking for those that believe. 